All right, welcome back. Uh, and we'll now go into the first panel session of the day. In this panel, we will take a look at the uses and benefits of AI and robotic surgery in hospitals and what considerations hospitals should have when introducing these technologies. It's my pleasure to introduce our expert panel for today. We've, we have with us Dr. Sichon Rotipong, Assistant Director of Siriraj Hospital in Thailand, Dr. Chua Hua Singh, uh, orthopedic surgeon, Sangwei Medical Center in Malaysia. And last but not least, Dr. Zhu Gang, Associate Chief Medical Officer, United Family Healthcare China. A very warm welcome to you all and thank you for being here with us today. Uh, I'll start off with asking each of you to just briefly introduce the types of AI or robotic surgery you have at, our at your facility. So maybe firstly, um, our I will ask Dr. Sichon, could you briefly tell us about the types of AI applications <clears throat> at your hospital and what are the key benefits you have seen so far? All right, thank you very much. And I'm very happy to be here with you guys, everyone. Uh, first of all, I come from the Sidirat Hospital. We are one of the largest uh, public hospital in, in Thailand and one of the oldest as well. So right now we have a couple of AI applications that have been implemented at Sidirat Hospital already. Uh, the first one probably going to be the one that came in during the, the first attack of the COVID-19 during like a couple of years ago that we uh, had a CT chest COVID-19 that together with the Huawei uh, technology company that brought that innovation to, to our hospital, which helped us a lot during that period. And then the second one that uh, our professor from the Department of Ophthalmology developed together with uh, another department of engineering from another university that uh, the system using for the diabetic technology screening. So instead of the patient coming in and waiting uh, to see the ophthalmologist, the, they can just go directly to another department and taking the uh, original imaging and just go home and waiting for the result to send that to, to the home. And then the, the latest one is about the AI pathology. Uh, we uh, already switching from the analog slide, like the original glass slide to the digital slide. And we are training the, the AI system to help the pathologist to detect the abnormal cell <laughs> and which uh, increase the rate of the, giving the diagnosis to the, the patients and other uh, specialists. So these are like a, a couple of examples uh, at the beginning of the session. Thank you. All right, thanks very much for that, Dr. Shichuan. Uh, very interesting to hear the wide range of AI applications at Siri Raj. Um, Dr. Zhu, I understand that United Family Healthcare is one of the first private operators in China to use robotic surgery. Could you just share a little bit on the types of robotic surgery that's available? Um, okay, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's uh, been uh, very glad here to discuss this. Uh, AI in the hospital. Uh, the Beijing United Family Hospital, actually we have a, it's a group. We having uh, the hospitals not only in Beijing, but in Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Tianjin, and uh, Qingdao and Seoul. So uh, um, yes, they be uh, developing this year. I think the AI, the new techniques really help the uh, development of a clinical service. Um, and some, uh, uh, you know, so, so I'm a urological surgeon. So I've been using the 3D image construction in all the uh, uh, difficult cases, uh, tough cases. So really this can help us in the patient education, patient counseling and the pre-surgery planning. And also we've been using this one in the surgical navigation, uh, such as kidney surgery and also the prostate cancer surgery, so we call the radical prostatectomy. So we're using the navigation uh, to helping us to perform a more precise surgery. <clears throat> Besides that, we're having the Da Vinci system in the hospital. This for, you know, this uh, is uh, it's an uh, instrument for all the surgeons. They can want to do the previous laparoscopic surgery. No, they'll know they can do the robot, robotic surgery. 
and also for the orthopedics, we have macro uh, uh, robotic surgery. It's been uh, 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 in the hospital for, for a few years. So we increased number of the patient accepted uh, this kind of surgery as well. So uh, I think this, uh, there, there will be bright future for the AI application in the, in the hospital to improve the profile of the uh, treatment, particularly the, uh, you know, improve the uh, service uh, uh, safety and the quality. Right, thanks very much, Dr. Chu. Um, Dr. Chua, I understand Sunway similarly offers robotic surgery. So maybe uh, you could briefly share what are some of those surgeries and what are the key benefits you have seen from robotic surgery so far? Okay, hi. Um, good morning, everyone, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for inviting. Uh, I'm personally, I am a orthopedic uh, joint and arthroplasty surgeon, okay? Uh, so I probably later I will uh, zoom in a little bit more about the robotic surgery that I use. But uh, in, in Sunway Medical Center, we we are one of the earliest one to, to embark on robotic surgery, obviously. And uh, Sunway, um, from the start, always think that this is where the future lies and this is what we should be, be putting in the, the emphasis into it. Uh, we have Da Vinci, we have uh, many, many other robotic surgeries. And uh, I started, <clears throat> I joined Sunway uh, Medical Center since last year. Uh, I was being brought in to try to champion the, the robotic joint replacement service in the, in the, in the hospital. Uh, we have managed to brought in a couple of systems of robotic surgery in orthopedic, uh, namely the Mako Smart Robotics, as well as the Rosani system. So both these are uh, mainly robotic uh, surgery or robotic assist surgery for uh, joint replacement. And um, <clears throat> I'm personally, I'm very, very passionate about this. I, I was exposed to Mako uh, probably about seven years ago when I was doing my fellowship in, in Australia. And uh, I have always been very passionate and I think that robotic surgery uh, in general and in particularly in specifically in, in joint replacement will definitely help us to increase the, the, the accuracy as well as the safety uh, in terms of giving uh, our patient, the joint replaced patient, a uh, much better uh, joint as well as a much uh, easier rehab joint as well as a more, more natural joint uh, for them to, to, to use. Uh, that's that's why I, I wanted to bring this particular technology into the country uh, for many years. And uh, with the, the help of Sunway, finally, we, we managed to do it. Uh, we are the first and only for now uh, hospital in the country to have both the robotic uh, joint replacement system. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much, Dr. Chua, and um, <clears throat> thanks to all three panelists for the brief introduction. Um, just a very quick note to those watching, if you have any questions for our panel, please feel free to ask them in the Q&A box on the event platform. Right. Um, before, uh, we'll just really go into the discussion proper. Um, I'll go back to Dr. Sichon and pose this question about AI. Um, we have heard so much about the benefits of AI, but we know that many Asian hospitals have not yet taken the step to adopt AI. What would you say are the key challenges to introducing AI in hospitals? And are there certain mistakes you made when you first started using this technology that you would rather others not make in their, in their journey? All right, so I will say about the, the challenges that... Uh, can be like a barrier for implementing the, the AI system. Mm -hmm. I would say the first of all, uh, the, the AI system or the AI technology itself, it based on the, the established infrastructure of information technology system and also the data management. We, when we were talking about the AI, it's about the data, how, how do you collect the data, how do you process or analyze those, those data and make it uh, to be useful for, for the, the application. And the barrier is, is, is like uh, some hospital, even still use like the traditional handwriting medical record or, or documentation, or uh, maybe having a little bit better systems such as like uh, the scan document, but still it's stored in like a, like a photo-like 
fine. So it's unsearchable. So with this like traditional system, it could be like a, a small barrier for hospital to adapt or implement the AI technology. And uh, also sometimes I think it's a bit of the policy matter as well. In some area, in some hospital, they have another issue that they have to focus on uh, or looking through closely. Maybe like during the pandemic, they already have uh, a burden uh, handling the pandemic, like uh, doing the policy to make the healthcare workforce not to be overburdened or something like that. They have, and it's not wrong if they, if they don't have a, a policy discussion on app, apply the, the AI uh, just right now. It, it needs time as well. And also the, the communication with the doctors or provider and also the patient is also a big issue because I'm not sure about the, the situation in, in Malaysia or in China. Some patients, when we, when we communicate to them that, okay, we have a new system that you don't have to see the doctor today. And then they just got panicked, like, wow, why not? I mean, I want to come to the hospital to see the doctor. And then, okay, you just go to that department and then you sit uh, to the big camera and then you just scan we just scan the, the the retina of your eyes and then you just go home and it's like but i want to see the doctor but you get the same result but that's something that we, we need to have a, another support system to to making the ai application uh that can happen and then making the satisfaction to the patient as well so that that, that could be something that uh, uh that uh maybe our lesson learn that the communication can be can help us to uh, making the implementation of AI system uh, happen. Yeah. Right, indeed. Um, I, I saw Dr. Chua smiling over there. <laughs> Maybe you had some similar experiences as well. So, so, but personally, I, I think um, at any one point of time, we should. We, I, I am the type who will embrace technology. We should embrace the technology. We should embrace the improvement and in every single sense, right? Uh, be AI, be robotic. But uh, at the same time, towards the patients as well, we, we should also uh, make sure that we, we, we give the patient the, the, the adequate information as well as the adequate yes. Uh, yes. Uh, human touch. Um, make no mistake, I, I think we all... We, we, if we are doctors ourselves, we know sometimes there's just so much more into treating a patient. We are just not treating the patient in terms of the pathology. We also have to treat them mentally and emotionally as well. Exactly. And um, embracing AI, embracing robotic, those are assistance to us. They will, at any one point of time, should not be uh, perceived to be the one that is going to completely um, uh, 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 take over our, our job as a doctor. And, uh, and we all, with the complementation from the robotic and the AI, will make us a better doctor. They will help us in terms of the algorithmic, in terms of the, 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 the huge database behind. But they will not be able to help us in terms of the emotional uh, expression uh, towards the patient, as well as understanding the patient. So that part, uh, personally, I think uh, every single one of us should, should, should understand before we embrace or, or walk in and, and step into this AI and robotic world. This is what uh, I personally, I think. All right, thanks very much for that, Dr. Chua. Um, Dr. Chu, I wanted to pose this question to you, like, um, you know, we've spoken about the challenges uh, or the lack of adoption of AI in Asia. Um, it's also the same story for robotic surgery, which are not so common yet in Asia. So in your opinion, um, what are the barriers to robotic surgeries? It's a very, uh, very good question. It's quite a challenge. You know, I need to, I need to be politically right. Uh, because really, you know, everyone understands that Bari is really from uh, financial uh, issues, considerations. The, you know, we have a Da Vinci system from 2015. It's been, uh, you know, once I started it, I, I don't want to do the lab, lab for animal. Conventional laparoscopic is good. But as compared with the uh, robotic surgery, it's not comparable. Even the data 
you know, the student they can achieve the same uh, oncology control, uh, you know, similar, you know, uh, the, the functional uh, recovery. And, but, you know, so we seen much better, you know, I'm a little bit old, uh, old doctor because I've been experienced from open laparoscopic surgery and the robotic surgery. Luckily, uh, I'm, I, you know, I had that, that experience. Uh, we compare the patient, we find that, you know, really the patient that they having can achieve much better results from the robotic surgery rather than, you know, open and, uh, you know, uh, laparoscopic surgery. And also the pain control is better and the function of recovery is better. And even the recently, I find that in the guidelines, uh, European urology guidelines, I find that the mortality rate, the lowest in the robotic surgery. So there's a lot of uh, advantage of developing the robotic surgery in the future. And uh, I say, you know, we, uh, we say money, uh, if there's money is a consideration, maybe it's not a big issue in the future. Because, you know, uh, when we started the laparoscopic surgery, it's, uh, you know, the instruments are exp expensive, the hospital administrative that don't accept it, uh, the price was too high, but now it's, uh, you know, every operation, operation room it, it be instrumented with uh, laparoscopic uh, uh, staff. So I think in the future, uh, the robot will be uh, become popular uh, once, you know, we have a more, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, price acceptable, uh, robots on the market, I think it will be becoming popular. And so its benefits has been approved in the uh, last, uh, you know, maybe nearly uh, 20 years. So I think the future is there. So it's evidence there. Uh, you know, I think there will be big development of uh, using robotic surgery, uh, in, in, you know, not only in the developed country, but also even some developing country. So, yeah, that's, that's my thoughts. Actually, about, you know, previous uh, topic, uh, I want to give some comments myself. You know, I think, uh, you know, being in whatever language we say, see doctor or see patient, uh, really we need, to, we need to see the patient physically. And this not only about, you know, the, the picture of the patient, but also uh, the, the, you know, the smiling or, or you know, a chemic, some chemical, uh, reactions between the doctors and the patients is uh, is completely different. So I think still think you know even we develop the AI technology, uh, but it's um, so far I don't think it can replace the the physical uh, you know the we see the patient. So uh, still the long way to go. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much, Doctor Chu. I think um you have sort of answered one of the questions from the audience, which is whether AI is only for developed countries with high GDP. So you're saying um, in the future might not be the case. Um, any thoughts on this, Dr. Sichuan or Dr. Chua? May I go first? Yeah, sure. I, I, I think it's not only for the, the high GDP country for sure. And I think if, if we are limited only for the, the high income countries, I think we are talking about the access or the equity to access the, the medical technology and medical equipment. So I don't think that that, that is correct or that is, is quite fair for, for the rest of the world. But, uh, and then the follow-up question is like, how can we make it beneficial for all? I think it's right now, it's not about one nation working itself alone. I think it's about a partnership. It's a global partnership, it's global connection. When we're talking about the AI system, <laughs> The more data that you put into the system, the more accurate, the more beneficial of the AI that can be used for the, the human kind for all. So I think it's about a partnership between nations. And then we also have like a, a different uh, in genetic information about the, what do you call it, the, uh, public health uh, problems, uh, epidemiology, different around the world. So these data can put into the system and it can make the AI system even better. So it's about the partnership, it's about the networking that can working all together. It may be like a network of the orthopedic surgery, it's about the, the public health, it's about the, the ophthalmology, it's about the pathology. And then these uh, partner work together in some specific field and then develop the AI system for specific certain properties that, that probably gonna make my comment for now. Okay, um, I, I want to add a little bit on the challenges. So, so sometimes when we look into uh, any any situation and everything, we, we, we should 
somehow divide them into seeing what, what exactly what are the parties that's involved into getting this so-called uh, uh, robotic surgery or AI into the healthcare system per se. <clears throat> so there are, there are a few entities that we need to, 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 to acknowledge. Entity number one is obviously is the health healthcare providers, which is the doctors, we ourselves. Now, this is entity number one. Entity number two is the, the healthcare receiver. So the patients themselves, whether or not they are, are they embracing onto the idea about being uh, operated on by robotic surgery is entity number two. Entity number three is obviously from the hospital side, whether the hospital administrator, whether they believe into this particular trend and whether or not are they going to put in the effort as well as potential investment into, into funding this thing. And, and make no mistake, we, we, we are not, we, we know the challenges sometimes in, in, a, in a nutshell, in an easier way, many people just say, ah, money, it's expensive, it's difficult. And if you were to every single time think that it's just the money is the issue, then uh, we, we know that's important, but that is not <coughs> the only issue per se, okay? So now let's look into the first entity that I was talking about in terms of the doctors or the healthcare providers. Uh, for, for a hospital or for us as a healthcare providing to embrace onto this particular uh, technology or the improvement, it is very important that whichever doctors who are actually doing this, number one, has to be properly trained, passionate, and believe in it. This is by far the most important if you were to ask me. If the, the last thing you want is for the healthcare providers to think too much about the economic side of it. I mean, no mistake, we, we, we understand that the economic side of it is important, but as a healthcare providers, it is very important that we should not keep thinking that, oh, this robotic surgery or AI is just a marketing gimmick. It's just something that is going to increase the, the numbers of patients or the, the work, the flow of the patient coming into my clinics. That is the last thing that the healthcare providers should think. We, we should think as the healthcare providers that whether or not this technology, it is really helping the patient and whether it really improve in terms of the healthcare providing that we, have, we can do. This is number one. That is from the healthcare provider per se. So, so in, in all in all, in any one of you who want to, 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 to drive this through, one of the challenge is to find a champion doctor, a champion consultant or a champion surgeon who really believe in it. This is number one. Okay. Number two, talking about the patient. So in order for the patient to understand the, the, the whole, whole benefit and everything from it, they will, number one, whether or not they believe what the doctors are saying and in providing this, number one. Secondly, whether the noise surrounding in the market, market whether it is, is it enough or not. And last but not least, obviously, words of mouth, the patients, the friends and everything is going to tell them. So this is another challenge per se, whether or not this patient is going to feel is robotic really doing something for me? Okay. And then the last entity, just now we were talking about the hospital administrators and the financial behind. So these are all the people who look into the economics, who look into the numbers and think and see whether or not this thing makes sense or not. But for sometimes for new technology that come in, why is it that people talking about potentially the entire GDP people is uh, easier for them to adopt this kind of thing? It is because to them, economically, to part with that part of the money for the development as well as the improvement, it's probably more easier because they don't have to put a lot of economics into taking care of the essentials the essentials are already being taken care of. Now we have access. What else can we improve? That's when a higher GDP country can talk about putting in their money into this kind of new technology slightly easier. Okay. Whereas for a developing country like us, sometimes we need to think that sometimes certain amount of money has to be taken, taking care of the essential first. That's when you see, ah, oh, we don't have a lot of access. So now how? how are we going to go about channeling this, this whole thing through, right? So these are all the, the potential challenges that I, I could see that we will face in our developing country. But make no mistake, I think we have the brain, we have the, 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 the understanding. It is just how to go about doing it.
Right. Thanks very much, Dr. Chua. I think you have covered quite a few aspects of what hospitals need to consider when um, before they introduce AI. Um, let me go to Dr. Zhu and ask about, I mean, from the perspective of robotic surgery, um, what, uh, you know, what, what should healthcare providers who are exploring this consider? And once they have made the decision to adopt this, how should they plan like a implementation roadmap to introduce it into their hospitals? Um, yes, okay. Actually, um, we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, the concern is uh, uh, financial, uh, uh, you know, consideration. Uh, but I think, you know, we, uh, once we on the market, we have more uh, options. Uh, I think we, you know, we can, it, it will come in cheaper. That is, uh, that is, uh, that, I think that is a rule. Uh, so far, um, you know, in China, uh, with my knowledge, they have, uh, they have developed uh, uh, and these four versions of uh, the Chinese robot, it's been uh, on the clinical trial. It's been, uh, one of them has been approved by the Chinese FDA. So it's uh, very soon it will be on the market. So uh, I think it's, uh, this, uh, this will provide the opportunity not only for China, but also for other, uh, maybe, you know, low uh, GDP uh, countries. So I think it, it will be becoming more popular. And also uh, another consideration is, uh, uh, I don't think we need, no, we need to worry about, you know, uh, safety and the effectiveness of the robot, because uh, as I mentioned before, it been, has been approved already, uh, scientifically has been approved. And, and also the, the patients, uh, you know, they loved some the new techniques, loved some new uh, knowledge, like some the new instruments. Uh, previously, we have an uh, international meeting. We want to compare the open surgery, laparoscopic surgery, and the da Vinci surgery. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we talked with a patient. No patient choose the open surgery. So that is a trend in the future. We need to really, whatever we say, embracing or not embracing, that's a trend. If you don't have this uh, advanced uh, uh, technique instrument, uh, you will lose a patient. That, that is for sure. So uh, I think this is not only for, you know, not only the surgeons like new toy, but also for the administrative, they need to think about the trend of develop, development on the, on the, on the, of the patients. The patients really keen to be treated with uh, new, safer, uh, better result uh, uh, instrument and technique. So uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, we are working on that, uh, particularly the, the, the Chinese engineer, they developed uh, some version of the robots uh, very soon, I think it uh, will be available on, on the market. All right. Thanks very much, Dr. Chu. So I hear that, um, I think this is in response to one of our audience questions as well, asking about um, what's the pace of using AI and robotics in China. Um, I think I hear from you that um, it's going to pick up pretty soon or in the future with the development of the Chinese meat robots, right? Yes. Uh, right. So far, we have uh, over 200 uh, uh, Da Vinci robots in, in China, but this uh, surely is not enough. You know, China is a big country. We, uh, you know, in the U.S., there was over 1,000 there. So the big gap between the China and the U.S. So I think we need more robots. Maybe uh, the products not only from, from the U.S., but also from China, from the, I think it's from the Korea, Japan, and also Europe, they've been, they're also developing the robots there. Mm, I see. All right. Thanks very much, Dr. Chu. Um, I'm also interested to hear what uh, Dr. Shichon thinks about the pace of the usage of AI robotics in Thailand. Maybe you can share on that. Uh, AI and robotic, uh, the application in Thailand? Uh, the adoption or like the pace uh, of uh, yeah, usage there. Oh, I think it's, it's going to be like a, a next agenda for, for the whole society in Thailand because uh, not just the Ministry of Public Health, but also the Ministry of the Digital Economy and also the Science and Education. We turn our focus into the AI technology and also the robotic technology as well. So together, like I mentioned, like uh, from the last question that we have to work together, not just only the in the healthcare <laughs> sector, but also the another sector like engineering and also the information system. So uh, we uh, allocate some budget for the 
some hospital that applied to be the pilot testing area and Zirak Hospital was one that got selection and then we uh, we developed the, the project called like the Zirak Smart Hospital that uh, we introduced the technology and we invite a uh, new startup and also the private sector and come and join work together and develop the AI system and also another uh, application that uses the newly technology and from this uh, we announced that uh, the successful of the implementation and then another hospital join in later this year and then they can try our application and then from from this uh, step then the, in the future there will be more and more hospital and also the maybe the smaller clinics and also the rural hospital can get benefit from this uh, technology as well and for other robotics uh, as i mentioned earlier that uh, when when i was a medical student like maybe like 10 years ago i have seen some of the da vinci system already in 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 the hospital and we are also uh, introducing more and more and i believe that another hospital in thailand they already have some as well all right, thanks very much, Dr. Shichon. I think Dr. Chua, you mentioned a little bit earlier about um, you know, the rate of adoption in Malaysia. Anything else to add on, on that front? Okay, um, uh, again, I, I think I, I would like to somehow uh, echo what Dr. Chu was saying just now about losing out. Um, you see, like what I have said just now, that there are obviously two type of healthcare providers. Care type number one is the one who really believe in it, passionate in it and wanted to do it, right? The second type obviously is, oh, I don't want to lose out. My, my patient load is getting lesser and lesser because you know the clinic next door, the, the hospital next door is having this new technology and that uh, they, are, they are pulling our patient away. So, so yes, as is it as it is now i mean i i cannot say for sure for all the da vinci or any, any other thing but in terms of just the robotic joint replacement per se in the country there are now noises uh, among some other hospital that is uh, in close proximity to our hospital that is strongly as well as seriously thinking about also uh, putting in uh, the effort into getting in the the the, the robots I suppose these are all like like Dr. Chu has said, the fear of losing out, right? And um, and I suppose if you were to, just to talk about the fear of losing out and and, and adoption and everything, uh, it also depends on whether or not the, the healthcare providers, the doctors, are uh, believing in it or, not, or, or or feel strongly enough in it into putting in the, the effort. Um, I again, I would strongly strongly. Um, uh, reiterate that if you were to think that you want to embark onto this technology just as a marketing tool, uh, please uh, think many, many times. It's not, it should not be that way. All right. Thanks very much, Dr. Chua. Uh, um, we do have quite a few questions from the audience coming in. So um, let me just pose it to all three of you, um, this next question. So this is how, this question is, how does utilization of AI and robotics fit into the equation of value health? Any examples you have to show the technologies aid in improving the actual value of healthcare? Um, yeah, I think here, um, you know, the, the, the person is asking, you know, there's so much investment going in, um, not just financially, there's also engagement with clinicians, making sure they're on board. How do you make sure that this actually translates <clears throat> into actual value in care? Um, any, which uh, Dr. Cha or Dr. Ju like to take this question? Uh, I'll start, I'll start, okay, first. Great. I'll start first. Okay, let, let's talk about a robotic joint replacement, so to say. Personally, now, the, 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 the data is out there, okay? With and without the robotic, there are a few things that we, we really need to look into it in terms of the value per se, or in terms of the, the, the macroeconomics as, as such, is number one, we, we realize that to patients, um, the, 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 the average length of stay is lesser, okay, for a, a, a com compare conventional and a robotic one. So that by itself is already reducing in, in terms of the, 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 the expenses that is necessary, this number one. Okay. Secondly, the usage of the pain relief is lesser because of us using the robotic, the usage of the pain relief 
post-operatively is lesser. This is number two. Next, in terms of the rehabilitation, the, the rehabilitation immediately after the surgery, the need for it is also lesser because now the joint is being put in more accurately than it, it transpired towards a, a easier rehabilitation. Next, you should even, even also need to look into with the joint being placed in more accurately, the, the, the longevity of the joint is going to be longer. So the, the patient that having a new joint coming back for a revision surgery will be lesser in the long run. Okay. And, um, and, and, and um, so all, all this, if you were to look into it, add values in a, in a, in a major way. That means the, for the patient, the revisit back to the hospital for one particular procedure, is, it's, it's definitely going to be lesser. So it all depends on how is the remuneration in terms of the financial remuneration in the country. Different country obviously has got different, different way. But that is how the, the robotic surgery as of now with the data that is, we have out there uh, is, is supporting towards uh, adding value to the patient as well as the health economy as a whole. Great, thanks very much, Dr. Chua. Uh, Dr. Chu, anything to add on in terms of robotic surgery's value at to healthcare from your perspective? Okay, I think uh, I, I would agree with Dr. Uh, Chow uh, about the you know, orthopedic uh, uh, you know, uh, robotic treatment results. And I, uh, the same uh, consensus with my other orthopedic surgeons. Um, I think he, the core of the medical care is to uh, you know to to providing a safe and a high quality of a medical service. The patient coming to the medical center is to uh, you, you know ask help and to get rid of the disease, and uh, you know they can uh, simply back to the to the life and to the work. So um, I think uh, you know the so it's, it is important to secure uh, these two goals. Um, uh, you know, robotics ro robots are the just a tool of a, of a, of a surgeon. It may can uh, achieve better results. Surely, it's not the the, the whole part whole of the so, uh, medicine. It's also still need a you know good hands, well trained, uh, well knowledge the, the the physician to handle this. Because so far, even we code the robot, but it's not doing it itself. It's still controlled by the surgeons itself. So. Uh, so you know, even you have the the, the tools, they need to be ready uh, to know how to use it, how to use it properly. So this is uh, ready to be, you know, another another level we need to improve. Thanks very much, Doctor Chu. Um, Doctor Shichuan, I will now pose the question about um, AI to you. So. Combining the previous question about, you know, the value that AI can provide to healthcare, we also have a new question from the audience about um, how AI can contribute to the shift to preventive care. Um, maybe you could answer from that perspective, you know, um, how, you know, the potential of AI in contributing to both value-based care and preventive care um, moving forward. All right. Thank you very much. It is quite a long question yes. but, okay <laughs> all right uh, uh let's start with the first one about the value for health or value of public health beside the the clinical outcome that can be measured like we have like a, a, it's a tangible outcome but it's also something it's like intangible that cannot be measured like directly that uh could be like a worriness uh, could be like anxiety and also like a pain something like that 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 patient have to encounter when coming to receive care but let's say like uh, when the patient has something like let's say have some a mask in in the hand and then they have to take it out and waiting for the pathological result for two weeks but when we uh, apply the the ai system they could get the result within a week or maybe a couple of days so those create that reducing could reduce these intangible outcomes like uh, worriness and anxiety and painful during the waiting time. So this is another another value of applying uh, the AI and also the robotic system. And this is only for the for the patient themselves. But when we are looking in the in the bigger picture, when 
we can do things quicker, providing results sooner. Uh, the doctor have more time to taking care of the patient that they really need, like the high touch that we have to spend more time investigating or performing the physical examination. So the productivity itself also increased, not just only for the healthcare provider, but the whole system, like in the hospital. Instead of taking care of like maybe 20 patients a day, we can take care of patients like 100 maybe, if the, we have like a well-equipped AI system and robotic assist treatment. That's probably going to be my first answer. Yeah. All right. So um, that's the value of AI towards um, uh, healthcare in moving forward. All right. We have another question about robotic surgery um, that I would like to pose to Dr. Chu. Um, what do you see is the gap in robotic surgery at the moment? So as a healthcare provider, what would you ask? Uh, what would you challenge robotics companies to come up next aside? from, of course, cheaper robots. Uh, what, what would you challenge them to do next? Um, um, yeah, that is, uh, yeah, <laughs> that is quite a, a challenge, difficult as well. And, uh, um, you know, uh, because uh, um, with my experience, I think it's been also being uh, in the literature has uh, been reported, you know, the robotic surgery really can, can challenge, can uh, finish the, the more uh, complex surgery, like previously, uh, you know, kidney uh, cancers, kidney tumors, you have to remove the whole kidney. Uh, but now we find out uh, even we don't remove the whole kidney, we just remove uh, all the tumor is enough for we could, because we can have achieve uh, the same oncology control and the patient can live longer. They can, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they can also reduce the uh, acute kidney uh, failure as well. So there are a lot of uh, a lot of advantages of this uh, robotic surgery. So um, yeah, you know, so it's it has been approved. It's uh, it's uh, uh, advantages of uh, in the uh, in the care and also it's proved its value in the medical care. So um, yeah, as, uh, because uh, advantages there pros cons they can be ob very o obvious. Uh, so the, there is a need of the development of these uh, robots. And, uh, but considering uh, financial uh, issues, uh, I think, uh, you know, more products uh, from uh, on the market, the lower price will, it will be. So that's, that is uh, my thoughts, you know, you know development of, of the future. But uh, still, um, with my knowledge, with my experience, the Da Vinci system is still the, the highest standards. So they need to... Uh, the, the new uh, newcomers need to catch up. Uh, so uh, you know, for the new uh, robots, uh, they they must do a lot of uh, investment to improve the, the techniques to have a um, much more better function. So to come uh, to catch up or surpass the the Da Vinci system. Right. Curious to hear how uh, Doctor Chua thinks about this with your. Uh, current robots. What's on your wish list for the next generation of robots? Okay, wish list. Um, number one, I've, I I would think as a whole. Let's not talk about myself. It's about the training. I would I would think that I I would hope that all these robotic uh, company would come out with a more structured training for all the junior surgeons who ever who are interested into getting to know these robots and know how to use it. Uh, when I say structure, it will means that you know a proper certification and everything, so that um, uh, we, we do not want bad apples out there in the market using the robot and not doing it properly and doing it correctly. This is this is number one. Uh, personal wish list on to what the robot can improve. Uh, it will be um, the size of the robot. Sometimes, if you can downsize the size, that will be that will be good. Uh, the mobility of the robot, if the robot can be moved from one place to another place in which then it will help us in to covering the, 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 the area bigger. Uh, what other wish list? If we can do it or control it even more remotely with the help of 5G, 6G, we do not know in terms of the, 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 the speed of the networking. That will help uh, a, 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 a really, really, let's say a really, really good surgeon uh, doing a very complex surgery from very, very far. 
Um, so these are all the, the, the wish list that I could. Uh, last but not least, if there are also a check and counterbalance in terms of the robot and the, and the surgeon, I suppose that will also add in a little bit more value in terms of the, the robotic per se. Mm, thanks very much, Dr. Chua. Um, if there are any robotics companies listening to this, you have heard Dr. Chua on his wish list. So um, please accept this challenge. <laughs> All right. Um, so really going back to um, the main theme of this panel, which is, you know, trying to find out um, what are the challenges uh, that Asian hospitals are facing uh, in adopting AI and robotics. I would like to ask Dr. Sichon, are there certain common myths or misunderstandings about AI and robotics? Um, maybe the top few that you have commonly come across from um, either patients or your fellow clinicians and so on. All right, it's, it's not just like um, a myth or wrong belief, but I believe that a uh, uh, healthcare provider at present, like in right now, we are the product of from the past. And when we were in, the, in school, like medical school, something like that, our professor told us that you have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in your skill of, of history taking and physical examination. You, you, you cannot rely on the data that you get from the machine or equipment. Because back in the old time, we didn't have that like a good quality of the technology, but you you can't help it because we, we learned from that like for years and it's kind of like our routine that we have to trust ourselves first and, and things change now. We are moving from the, the high touch, low tech to, to uh, high touch and high tech in the same time. So how, how can we, how are we going to making trust? How are we going to make the healthcare provider having trust into the new technology? It, it needs time to, to make that change. And I also agree with Dr. Sure that healthcare providers are separated into mainly two groups. The one that like a believer and a strongly believe and then ready to, to follow the step of the new technology. But we also have another group that, that we have to, to support them and, and making sure and making them uh, be assured that okay, it's okay to trust the system. It's okay to trust the AI. It's okay to to use the robot for taking care of the of their patients. So it's not the wrong belief, but it's just something that is the result from the past, and we just have to 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 make things go through the digital and and, and high technology transformation. And that is one thing. And also the same with the the pro, uh, the receiver as well, the, the patients. Like I mentioned earlier, that. Uh, Sometimes patients, they come to see the, the doctors and then they, they found out that, uh, okay, we're just going to see the machine or we're going to see the system, we're going to see the robot. And then they, they disappointed. And, and you, can, you can just help it because like for almost like 10 years, they come to see the same doctor every year. The doctor-patient relationship is quite strong. And it's pretty much like uh, I have one doc, one patient that we see each other like every year and pretty much I'm become... Uh, his son in, in some way, but anyway, and when he has to go to see the machine or we have to reduce the visit and he's disappointed. So uh, when we adopting the new technology, something that we have to take into consideration is also the patient satisfaction as well. The expectation of the patient themselves is just not the clinical outcome. That's the main priority, but also what patient really want, really expect when they seeking for healthcare support for me. All right, I see. Thanks very much. Um, how about Dr. Chua? Are, are these some of the same um, opinions and understandings that you get from your your peers and your patients? So 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 similarly like like I from the start I said we always look into all these things into three entities, right? So the healthcare providers, that's one that just like what C. John has said just now as well, and I, what I've said it again, again, and again. So it's a believer or the one who who, who think. So again, doctors are, are one of a group of a people whom, in a way, are generally very proud type of people. The ego is always there. It's like, uh, why should I follow this robot if I can do this? I think I'm doing it very, very well already. So whether or not, how do you, how do you uh, uh, get all these people to, you know, sit down, come, think back and embrace it and try and see. And, and next, next group is, of course, 
some some of them say that I, I'm already experienced. I'm I, I I don't need this anymore. So how are we going to be able to trick to 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 to, to train or teach an old dog some new tricks? Right. So this is another another part of the potential challenge in terms of the a, a, in in market in Asia. Uh, patients. I think Sichuan has covered it very very well. I I I like how how he the way he thinks about the patient uh, perception and everything. And last but not least, different country obviously have a different different financial remuneration. So this is the part where we also really really need to think about. In Malaysia, unfortunately for now, in if you will talk about our healthcare providing, it's uh two big two big group. Number one is the public hospital. Number two is the private hospital. The public hospital generally are uh, was heavily funded by the government, and uh, it all depends on where the government is putting the money. If the government is putting the money into the healthcare, in this such 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 amount, and if they have the, uh, the the extra, they probably can put into this, because at the end of the day, government do have the biggest uh, power in terms of the financial power per se. But when it comes to the the private sectors, uh, a lot of the financing come from the insurance company, and as of now. Um, the 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 insurance company in Malaysia do not support the so-called robotic usage just yet. They are not uh, uh, financing the robotic part of it. So if the patient were to come and get a robotic surgery in our center, for example, they do have to pay the gap in terms of the difference between the 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 the, the insurance willing to pay and what uh, we have to 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 charge. Uh, to the patient. So these are the, the potential difficulty, I would say, that really uh, each and every one of us should look into it and try to, to, to get through these hurdles in terms of uh, getting the robotic into the hospitals. All right, thanks very much, Dr. Chua. Um, Dr. Chu, you have heard from both uh, Dr. Si Chuan and Dr. Chua on, you know, um, the sort of feedback, the opinions uh, about AI and robotic surgery from their peers and their patients. Uh, how was it like for you um, right now or back when you first introduced robotic surgery into your hospital? Okay, I think uh, I fully understand uh, uh, the previous two panelists' uh, uh, comments. And uh, yes, it is, uh, uh, you know, the acceptance from the patients, from the hospital, uh, even from the government, the government uh, really takes takes time. It's evolving, uh, you know. Uh, as I mentioned before, in the uh, uh, in the international uh, meeting, we want to compare the open laparoscopic surgery and the robot, and no one uh, take the uh, you know open surgery now. So uh, you know they uh, really um, uh, you know. I think the patients, uh, they will take time to accept, you know, the, the robot, robotic surgery. It's uh, needed to be in, uh, approved, uh, appro uh, you know, uh, by the surgeon and by not only one surgeon, but by the older surgeons in the, in the world to uh, the safety and the effectiveness of sort of issues. Uh, uh, so back to, uh, I, I started to use in the robotic surgery from 2015. And you know the indication is increasing, and the patient, most of the patients accepted this uh, this concept. They wanted they wanted it to be operated by the robots, and uh, also the insurance company. Uh, initially, they they don't approve. They don't approve. Okay, you do the laparoscopic surgery, I pay you. If you do the robot, I don't pay you. But now it's uh, less uh, uh, few, fewer and fewer. Uh, you know the, the answers like this. No, they they okay they pay. Pay and also need to uh, you know adjust the policy. We in the host in our host system, we uh, you know chat the, the 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 same as the laparoscopic surgery and the robotic surgery. So we don't chat extra uh, for the robotic uh, you know usage. So I think that that's uh, that's why the insurance company accepted it as well. Um, and also I think really uh, the advance of the uh, AI and AI I, I think it's not only the robot but also like 3D image reconstruction, uh, sort of uh, uh, the orthopedic uh, uh, MECO surgery, all add values to improve the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the medical care results and uh, really uh, reduce the uh, suffering uh, from the surgical treatment and patient come back to uh, life, come back to where they work earlier. 
So this is a really, you know, what we want to we want we wanted to improve. Uh, so for sure, for the for the robotic instruments, as uh, Dr. Uh, Chow uh, mentioned, really uh, this, uh, you know, we hope it become a smaller uh, sort of thing. That is our wish as well. And um, yeah, for the robot, uh, uh, it's it's something new. You like you know previously we doing the open surgery. Maybe you like uh, we can walk on the street, but you the laparoscopic surgery you like uh, you ride a bike, and then you have a new car coming. So you need a license. You need to be being trained. You need to know how to properly use it. So really, <laughs> this is a, a requirement. It's not only uh, for the system but also uh, for the surgeons and for the next generations and a uh, lot of challenges you know because uh, someone only can do the robotic surgery they don't know how to do the open surgery if there's some complications happened uh, how do you deal with that so this is also a challenge to to the medical system so we really need to train them not only know how to use the robotic surgery but also how to do the open surgery so a lot of challenges to the system. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much, Dr. Zhu. Um, we unfortunately are at uh, the last five minutes of our session. Um, so I would just like to pose one last uh, question to the panel. This is a question from the audience. Um, following up about the point uh, raised earlier about patient-doctor relationship. So, um, you know, will the reliance on AI technology dilute that relationship? And how do you maintain the patient-doctor relationship? Um, and is it important to do so in the first place? All right. Um, maybe Dr. Sichon, you'd like to take this question first? Yes. Uh, well, I, I, I don't think that we're going to say that it dilutes the relationship, but I think it's a wakes-up call that the new way, the new way of a patient-doctor relationship is going to happen soon. And also the AI technology is not it's not like uh, one size fit all. Some clinical diseases, they still have to, to come to see the doctor as well. And also, uh, like at the beginning of the session, that I said that it's about the communication, that we have to communicate with, the, with, the, with the, the colleagues and also the patient as well. This uh, something that coming in into the healthcare sector to, to support the care services to, to help the patient themselves and we can also use some regulation to make sure that the patient, uh, uh, doctor patient relationship still uh, happens and also the human touch still happening. It's like, uh, for example, it's like telemedicine, it's not like all visits can be on like a, be online or virtual. They have to come to the hospital and have a doctor performing the physical examination as well. It's pretty much the same. You can, you can use some kind of regulation to, to keep the human touch uh, in the system when we're providing care. And it's also the challenge, of course, like uh, it's not moving from the high touch, low tech to uh, low touch, high tech. We have to make the new era to be like high tech and high touch together. That's probably going to be what my answer is. Right. Thanks very much, Dr. Sichon. Dr. Chua, how, how do you think about this high tech, high touch approach? Um, and how, how, how do you think it's... Um, going to be implemented. So I, I actually like what Sichuan is saying, high touch, high tools. But at, at, at the end of the day, personally, I feel it's like that. Yeah. Any, even AI robots or anything, it's just a tool to us. Okay. We are the one that essentially we are doctors. We are the one that treating the patient. These are all the tools that to help you. It, it, it's not about over-reliance or anything. At, at the end of the day, even without all these tools, some doctors also don't talk to patients properly as well. Now, let's take a step back. It, it's, it, it's as simple as an analogy that you, you like just now Dr. Chu has saying that you have a car now. You have a car, it can give you a point A to point B. But that is when you want to use the car to go from point A to point B at that stipulated time, you want it to be fast. But does that mean that the car is going to take over your exercise? Let's say you want to do exercise. You know that you want to do exercise for one hour in a day. Do you use the car to do the exercise? You don't. So it's the same thing. AI and robotic, it's just a tool to us. 
we must always understand they are there to assist us into doing the things that they are best in doing. Okay, so a car is best in doing from A to B in a shorter period of time without us using our energy. Same goes with AI and robotics. It helps us with taking care of huge number of data. It helps us into doing pattern recognition. It helps us into doing algorithmic uh, solution. But does it help us in terms of getting the patient comfort and emotional uh, comfort and everything coming from a doctor's emotional expression? It doesn't. So we should not use that for this particular purpose. So all in all, as a doctor who adopt this AI or robotic, if you know exactly this particular tools where it stands, where it's supposed to be placed, where it has got the added value, do it and use it in that sense then you won't have any over-reliance as well as loss of the patient-doctor's uh, relationship. That's my point. All right. Thanks very much, Dr. Chua. Unfortunately, um, that is all the time we have for this session. Um, there are still a couple of audience questions um, which we are unfortunately unable to answer. So um, for the panelists, um, if you do have a bit of time later, do log into the platform to address those questions in the chat box. All right. Thank you once again to all our three panelists for joining us today. It has been a very insightful uh, and engaging discussion for all of us. Um, to those watching, we will now be taking a one-hour lunch break. Join us again at 1 p.m. Singapore time for the session by Curexo, which will introduce their affordable medical robots. See you there. Thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah.